We are here for Spartan Up, and we are interviewing Theo Epstein, the youngest GM in baseball history. 28. Took the Red Sox after 100, no, after 86, 86, 86, 86, 86, 86 years of being down, took them to the, the world champs. And Go then, Boston. And then did it in Chicago after yeah, 108 repeated years. Repeated it, right. Right? Who are we? We got Colonel Knight on my right. We got Joe DeSena, founder of Spartan, right here in the center. And we got Sephra the Seed Huntress to my left. And Marion, our producer and director behind the sacred camera. I always forget her, but you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> but, but in all seriousness, all right. we are your resiliency partner, right? We rip you out of bed every day. Every Tuesday, we've got an interview like this. But every other day, we've got somebody that's inspiring with a story, with a message that'll rip you out of bed, slap you on the butt. We all need it. Even you need it. Everybody right? needs it. Yeah, Everybody it needs awesome. it. And the deal is, we're going to dive into this interview. We're going to learn a ton. I learned a ton. Literally, yeah, this yeah, interview actually. changed my life. Yeah. And then we're going to do a little recap at the end. We'll, uh, we'll dive into some of the things we learned and maybe help people change their life. Yeah. Look forward to it. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Misfit Vapor 2 the perfect smartwatch for Spartans. Right now, all Spartan Up podcast listeners can take $50 off Misfit Vapor 2 with the code SPARTAN50. Head over to misfit.com to redeem. This offer expires June 26, All right, we are here at Fenway for Spartan Up Podcast with Theo Epstein. We just ran the course together, believe it or not. Um, you've never you've never covered the whole stadium like that before. No, I saw parts of Fenway I've never seen before. Did, it was really did. cool. And it brought back some great memories, popping inside the clubhouse and around the player parking lot and walking the halls. I walked for 10 years. It was fun. Did you ever think you'd be throwing a spear at Fenway? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was the first. A couple of times I probably wanted to over the years, but finally got to. How old were you when you were here? That, when did you start? Oh, well, I, I mean, I grew up here. So my family moved here when I was four, and we lived less than a mile from Fenway Park. So I grew up coming to games here my whole life. And then I came back here and got the job as uh, GM at 28. So I and was here for, for a decade, starting at age 28. Between four and 28, were you looking at this place and saying, this is where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the general manager <laughs> of this place? Or? Well, from about four to 17, I wanted to play shortstop here. And then I realized that wasn't going to happen. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I kind of got involved in baseball, but the Red Sox always seemed um, like such an insular place. It just, I, I never thought I could work here. It was kind of run by a certain group and they never really looked outside the organization. So I, I started, got an internship with the Orioles, um, went to work for the Padres for seven years and then got really lucky where my boss got involved in the management of the Red Sox and he brought me with them, so I was lucky. And, and how rare was it at 28? Like, did they bring in most GMs at 28? Uh, no, I was the youngest ever at the time. Um, it was right when, when the industry was starting to change. Um, GMs had always been former players or longtime scouts, usually guys with a lot of experience in their 50s and 60s. And then, um, you know, with the information age, the game just started to skew a little bit younger because there were more analytics involved and you had to process a lot of information as part of the job. So um, that was one of the one of the first real young ones. And uh, we, we joked about that all the time in the office. I surrounded myself with a lot of um, same age people who were willing to just dive in and work 100 hours a week and try to turn the Red Sox around. We said, well, if we fail, they'll never hire anyone under 40 ever again to do this. But right. if, we, if we have success, maybe you know we can work in baseball for a while. And it was great. We ended up, uh, we got real close the first year. Um, we got to game seven of the ALCS. That's when Aaron Boone walked us off and kind of mm -hmm. broke our hearts. And then, so we were de real determined the next year we came back and beat the Yankees in Yankee Stadium and ended up winning the World Series. So it was, uh, it was a good start, which was important for someone young. Yeah. What, what do you think the secret was? If you had to boil it down to like one, two, or three things, what was it that you, you turned, was it 100 years they hadn't? 86 years 86 they hadn't years. won. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of things. The Red Sox had been, had a real inferiority complex uh, to, with the Yankees. They were constantly, you know, playing the, the little brother and they were just focused too much on keeping up with the Yankees, focused too much on sort of optics and making it look like they were competitive that you know, buy your season tickets, this could be the year, you know, next year could be the year, instead of just really focusing on what are the foundational elements that it takes to build a successful baseball operation and uh, to create some sustained success. Because the way you win a World Series is by getting the playoffs year after year after year. You can't just try to build an Uber team and then take 10 years off and do it again. You've, you have to really um, 
look at the big picture and invest in the roots of a solid organization like scouting, uh, analytics, player development, and then you have to create a mission. You want players who um, are here for a reason so they feel connected to each other and to the organization as a whole and are really on mission because baseball, you know, in the, at the big league level, they're all incredibly talented. They're elite players, all of them, and, and the real difference maker is, you know, makeup, mental makeup, you know, what drives them, how motivated are they, and then connection. Do they feel connected to each other and to the organization so that the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts? And that's what we created. And then from the front office side, it was really um, not being afraid to look stupid. You know, it was a time of great change in the industry. So you had to try a lot of new things in order to find something that worked. You know, baseball, it's kind of like life. We, we only understand like three or 4% of it. And the other 96, 97% is kind of unknown, we're guessing at. So we dove in to try to, and did a lot of research and development, just kind of chipping away at the unknown, trying to find small little insights into baseball that were empirically true and therefore actionable. And then we could apply it to our decision making in terms of selecting players and also on field decision making. And, and we had a group that wasn't afraid to, to look take stupid chances. and fail yeah. and take, take big risks. And so some of them paid off. And that's a great feeling when you know you've you got an entry level employee working for a year on this one theory that he has, or a hundred, and he, you throw out ninety nine of them because they don't work, and then one of them works. That helps you position a fielder in a slightly different place. One time you save one hit, which saves one run, which maybe wins one game, which maybe wins either pennant. And so that, that's sort of a microcosm of what the whole organization was was trying to do together. It's hard for you to test and learn though, right? Because you got to actually play a game. Yeah, you find ways to do it. Um, you know, everything from experimenting in the low minor leagues with, uh, you know, players who are a little farther away from the big leagues to, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you can use computers and run simulations. Miles. You can simulate 10,000 seasons and see, right. hey, what would our outcomes look like um, if we made this move versus this other move and then simulate 10,000 seasons. So, yeah, you just have to get creative and try to find ways to uh, test things. And uh, how many times were you like thinking, Man, I've completely screwed this thing up. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, there were, there were a number of times. I mean, from, from sort of poignant, dramatic moments like having a three-run lead in my first year in Game 7 of the ALCS at Yankee Stadium, and then, you know, uh, Pedro Martinez probably stayed in the game a little bit too long. We blew the lead, lost in extra innings on a walk-off homer. You're just like, oh, my God, we were one step away from the top of Mount Everest getting to the World Series, and now we have to go back to the – very bottom. How do you how do you take that first step to the bottom of the mountain again? That felt like we completely blew it. Um, I'm interested in in um, those moments where you're questioning yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I you know I think th there are a lot of moments when when you fail, you get negative feedback, and then um, you start to question. Um, you get bad outcomes, and you and and you start to question the process, and that's what you should do test the process again, but if you have sound process and you get bad results, you have to double down on the process. Because you know, you, even if you end up with a good result, but you have bad process, it's not rep, rep, replicable. Cool. You can't right. do it. So right. um, you, I think in times of failure, you, you, know, you, you sort of have this extra motivation, this extra energy, sometimes anger, sadness, disappointment. You don't know where to channel it. So we tried, you know, after we, we lost that uh, the walk off to end our season, we took 24 hours, we went out, had some drinks had a total bitch fest for 24 hours that we're giving ourselves one day and then we're coming back and we're going to have the greatest off season ever and come back and win the world series the next year. And we did and literally 24 it, hours later. That was the plan. Yeah. 24 hours to, you know, get it off our chest. And then we just poured ourselves back in the process. Like, okay, what can we fine tune? What can we tweak? What were we missing? Right. What did we not do? Cause we were a little bit afraid, you know, and then yeah. you channel that energy into facing our fears a little bit. But, how'd, how'd the community um, embrace that failure? Um, they were down. I mean, the Red Sox, the culture around the Red Sox at that time was that the sky is falling all the time. I right. mean, they were, you know, everything was uh, the sign of failure about to come because they'd, they'd had the, the football snatched away from them so many times sure. in 86 years. So, but you're young at that point. I'm wondering, is the community saying, well, of course, we got a 28 year old? I mean, yeah, were they and, you know, that first year went so well. I think they were really behind us, but they said, at the end, they said, same old Red Sox, same right. old. So we knew, but I think that's a big thing. Is we knew we couldn't get our, our motivation, our energy uh, from anything external. 
And so we, we really focused inward. We said, you know, we're going like, to win for each other. We're going to rely on each other. And that's what, you know, the, we haven't talked about the single most important element this entire thing, which is the players. You know, we're just kind of the background directing things, but the players are the ones who have to actually face the challenges head on. And in that clubhouse, what I really noticed was that um, they did it for one another. You know, they weren't concerned with the media. They weren't concerned with the fans. They didn't buy into narrative at all. They just said, like, David Ortiz, I remember, sat around said, looking at like Bill Miller and Pedro Martinez and Kevin Millar. Like, I don't want their season to end. And all the other, yet all 25 guys were looking at their teammates that they cared so much about and been and saying, I, you know, I'm not going to let him go out like this. And that's what really helped help lift the spirits. And that is that room. easier to do when you've got a long history of failing versus like if you're, um, I think so. Right? You know, I think, um, for me, I've always responded much better to, to building right. something. You know, I love, a blank slate, a mandate for change, you know, the ability to experiment and build something new, create a vision that everyone can buy into. I found it much, much more difficult to maintain, you know, to stay on top. It's really hard. It's why I have a lot of admiration for teams like the Warriors in basketball or, you know, the Braves won 14 straight division titles in Patriots. baseball, which is crazy. The Patriots in football. It's a funny story. After we won the first time in 04, I called Bill Belichick because they had done a really good job of staying on top for a number of years at that point. Yeah. And I asked him, yeah, I called him up, we small talked for a little bit, which he's not good at at all, uh, which I admire about him. But, and then I asked him, I said, hey, Bill, you know, how, did, how did you guys turn the page? Like, how did you come back the next year and, and, and do it all over again? He goes, oh, managing success? And I said, yeah. And he goes, ah, oh, Theo, two words for you. You're f <laughs> and that was pretty much the end of the conversation. So even he didn't, I think he was holding on to his secrets, but it is really hard. I think you have to, you have to change things up. If you bring back the exact same group and have the same message, it's going to go stale because you've already been through that. So I think bringing in, bringing in some players who haven't won yet, you know, have some leadership qualities, they become sort of a, a rallying cry. Yeah. And change the Does the, um, we talked about Pareto principle earlier before you walked in, right? The 80, 20 rule. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm soaking up everything you're saying to apply to our business, right? And hopefully people out there that have businesses or, or even family uh, that they're, they're focused on optimizing. Um, I keep saying to myself, I just want more of the 20 percenters. All right. But it, it, it wouldn't exist throughout the universe if it was that easy. Right. Right. So do you see that as well? Do you, like everybody can't be at 100 percent, right? Everybody's not playing at that perfect level. Yeah, I mean, I think the way we look at it is, um, you know, we're all a collection, collection of strengths and weaknesses, physically, mentally, and fundamentally. And so that's how we attack it in baseball. Is we, everyone gets an individualized player development plan. We're like we literally just list strengths and weaknesses in a development plan in all those areas. And it's interesting that the lower levels, you're doing all the talking, you're, you're laying out the whole plan for them and, and they're just following at that point. Because I think a lot of this too is, there's a big difference between your brain, your motivation, your skills when you're 16 versus when you're you know, in your mid 20s. So you take a 16 year old Dominican kid or an 18 year old high school senior or a 20 year old college kid just coming into the organization and you're having to lay out the plan, they're just nodding along, they're going through the motions, you're developing them, they don't even really know why. And then a couple of years in, you notice a switch where you sit down in those meetings to lay out the development plan, and all of a sudden they're pushing back saying like, no, 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 that's not a strength, it's actually a weakness, here's, here's what I can do better. And they're saying, they're laying out their goals for the year and how they're gonna get there. And we, as soon as that moment happens, it's like a switch goes on for every elite player, we know they're there. They're, they're developing themselves the rest of the way and that motivation's going. So I, I think, you know, we all have our own capacity. We all have our own, you know, unique backgrounds, perspectives, thoughts, fears, emotions. And if, if as an organization, we can help everyone push themselves and get beyond the level they would normally get to anyway, then that's success. We, we're ne you're never going to have, you know, everyone in the 20%. Perfect. Yeah. How'd you do it at the Cubs? Same, same playbook? A uh, little different playbook. I mean, we took some core principles with us, um, some some basic thoughts about the game, that I, some truths about the game, and that we wanted to build the organization around and controlling the strike zone and, and other large concepts. But I felt it would be a huge mistake to take what worked in Boston and just try to apply it to the Cubs because different sensibilities, you know, every uh, Cubs had their own unique history. And then the Midwest, it's a completely different animal than, than the East Coast. And you, you had to kind of understand that a little bit, take a step back and, and listen and, and learn. Um, at, the, at the Cubs, uh, it was a little different. We were starting from the absolute bottom 
that had uh, 100 years of losing and 103 years of losing at that time. And it, it was really a history based on failure. So, and, and we had at the time, we inherited the worst team in the division, the oldest team in the division, the most expensive team in the division, and the worst farm team in the division. So, so it was exactly what you wanted. The exact wrong quadrant to be in, which yeah. is great, because yeah. then it was a complete- It's only up from there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we were really transparent with our fans about a five-year plan. And we said, you know, look, we're, we're short-term interest collided with long-term interest. We're going to side on the, on the side of long-term interest. And that's going to be painful for you. That's going to be in players that you know and that you, you're connected to. They're probably going to be traded for three young players that you've never heard of. But bear with us and let's, let's, let's do this together. And we asked them to get interested in the minor leagues and the draft and sort of invest in our future with us. And the fans were awesome. They came along with us. And sure enough, um, about year three, we turned the tide. After three years, we started to turn the tide and be really competitive, building around a core of talented young players we'd acquired and the fans had got to know through the draft and through the minor leagues. And then in the fifth year, we ended up winning the World Series. Um, which is kind of more coincidence. It's kind of more coincidence than, okay. you know, it sounds yeah. like a f five year plan. You did it in year five, but yeah. it let us puff our chest out a little bit, you know, that, that it had worked that way. But, you know, our, our fans were, were great. I think the cool thing about baseball is it's best enjoyed in the moment, like up close from 50 feet away, you know, sitting in the front row, seeing the action. But it's best understood from like 50,000 feet, really removing yourselves and looking from a distance. You can see broader trends and understand the way the game's moving. and. So we tried to we tried to be honest with our fans about that and bring them along. So we kept the great experience of going to Wrigley Field because even in the lean years when we were losing 100 games, we were still selling out, which allowed us to keep revenues up and keep investing in in our future. Um, but we were explaining as we went, saying, "Okay, here's here's why we're trading these guys. Here why here's why we need high draft picks, and here's how the team's going to come together." So they went along that journey with us. Is that risky? The competitors see what you're doing if you're that transparent. I mean, we, we were transparent about the, the basics of what we were doing, but there's, there's always Science some, some secret it. sauce. Yes. All right, Spartans, we'll be right back to this episode in a second. We're gonna uh, step away, talk about our sponsor, Misfit Vapor 2, the smartwatch. And this is really a smartwatch. I mean, I think it's even smarter than Colonel Nye. And look, I, I just it might be. I, I, I just got it. I've honestly never really worn a watch before, but this one's super light. I can't even tell it's there. And it can it's got GPS on it. It can do all these fancy things with your phone that I don't even understand yet, really. Workouts and it's got a heart rate monitor on it. What what's a heart rate monitor good for, Colonel? Well, heart rate monitor is good for a lot of things, but if you're out there, if you're Spartan, if you're working out and you wanna hit your target rate and then you wanna hold that for a certain amount of time. Yeah. This thing can help you out. This smartwatch, you know, it's, and again, it, it goes back to your phone. It's connected. Um, so at the heart rate monitor, is great whether you're relaxing or working out, but really enhances a workout. You know what a really good feature for you is? It's uh, sweat proof there, it, Colonel. It, it, it was phenomenal. We got to use it here recently. Yeah. And, uh, as the team found out recently when we were doing the Baton Death March Memorial, mm -hmm. I am a uh, legendary sweater. He's like his so, own proverbial rainstorm. So, so if anybody can verify that this watch is sweatproof, I can. I, quite frankly, I never even knew it was on my arm. It was yeah. there. It's light. It's flexible, and it it held up under really tough conditions. It is awesome. It's also mud proof. <clears throat> Planting seeds, digging in the dirt. All right, guys. So an exclusive offer for our podcast listeners: you get fifty dollars off if you use the code Spartan fifty at Misfit.com up until June twenty sixth. So uh, we'll see you there. Hey Spartans, hope you're enjoying the podcast. Today, I want us to rethink everything we knew about carbohydrates. Low and no carbohydrate diets are all the craze right now, right? But I want us to understand when I talk about carbohydrates as a dietitian, what do I really mean? So I want us to think about the fact that carbohydrates are not the enemy. So let me repeat that carbohydrates are not the enemy. They play a major role in what we do. And here's a few examples, all right? Fresh berries, raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, they have antioxidants which are gonna help us recover from our training. So important. Because they have water content to them, they're also helping with our daily hydration. Next, let's think about sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes contain potassium, which is helpful in lowering blood pressure as well as decreasing the risk for muscle cramps. Finally, cherries. Cherries are a natural source of melatonin, which is gonna help us with our sleep 
at night, right? So having a snack of cherries later in the day might help it so that we can fall asleep. And sleep is so important for recovery. So when I talk about reducing carbohydrates, what I'm thinking about is things like highly processed foods, white breads, crackers, white pastas. Those aren't necessarily gonna help us towards our goals. The good carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates from vegetables and fruit are what's gonna matter. So I encourage you to try to build the habit of putting more healthy carbohydrates into your day. And hopefully as a result, you'll have less of cravings for those highly processed white carbohydrates. That's habit number 13. We'll get back to habit number 14 next, which is when nobody else is looking. Wonder what that's about. All right, let's get back to the podcast. If you'd like the full downloadable 31 habits of the healthiest Spartans, go to life.spartan.com slash habits. So how, how do you, how do you um, and I'm thinking about it for my own team, for, for, you know, for Spartan, but how do you identify amazing people, amazing players? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's much more difficult than identifying, you know, who can run fast or who can hit the ball far uh, or hit with power. So we ask our scouts as they're evaluating players for the draft, which are, you know, they're looking at high school seniors and college juniors um, to really focus off the field and to get to know the kids extremely well. So they start building a relationship two to three years before the draft for the players. They visit them in their house. They, 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 they get to meet their families and but we ask them to take it to another level and dig and get to know um, their teachers, their guidance counselors, their girlfriends or ex-girlfriends, their friends, their enemies, how they treat people behind the scenes. And then we won't even consider drafting a kid unless the scout can present to us in writing uh, three examples of when the player faced and overcame adversity on the field and three examples of when they faced and overcame adversity off the field. Because baseball is, is a game built on failure. It's inherent in the game itself. You're gonna, even the best players, get out seven out of 10 times. They're going to go from a big fish in a little pond to all of a sudden, you know, a small fish in in a much, much bigger pond. And everyone gets humbled in baseball. It's a it's a game that'll just as soon as you think you have it figured out, it'll knock you to your knees. And you have to be able. I think sounds like Spartan. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's why that's why I wanted to talk about. I think it's like learning how to pick yourself up, learn from failure, rely on a solid foundation that you've built up through your life, then make adjustments. You can't make adjustments unless you know your foundation. Sure. And you make adjustments and then come back stronger. It's huge and it's a habit. And if players haven't exhibited by the time they're high school seniors or college juniors, how are we gonna trust them when they get knocked down to do it? And we've made mistakes drafting ultra talented kids who've always had things too easy and have never learned how to bounce back from failure. And then they come and in pro ball, they fail and they get homesick and they quit or they don't, they don't know how to make adjustments because they don't know who they are. And it takes them years and years and years to figure it out, and by then it's too late. So at least as important as their on-field ability is um, their mental makeup and how they've learned um, to, to rely on themselves and reach out to others around them for support when times are tough. Grit. Yeah, right. exactly. A little Spartan it's a grit. grit. That's what it's called, yeah. the grit test. And we, so we believe um, you have to manufacture some adversity in the first world because mm-hmm. we're not living exactly. tough lives. Look at yeah. the couches we're on right now. Um, do you guys do that, or you or you're expecting the scout to find that individual? No, we put we push guys to fail. In fact, just uh, I was just on the phone with our farm director. We've got a group. We t- took a group of American kids, uh, first year in the organization, who've had life way too easy, and we sent them down to the Dominican Republic for three weeks uh, to to live with our Dominican players down there and show them what real. Hardship is, like, is yeah. all about, yeah. and they've done a lot of projects in the community down there, and helping build baseball fields. And um, the, the, they don't speak Spanish, so they're on their own. Now they get to see what it's like sure. to be in a, in a foreign land where change a frame you know, of reference. It, exactly, yeah. and build build empathy and build connection. And but baseball is a great game at manufacturing adversity because you're the the way the farm system is structured. There's six different levels, and as, as soon as you su- have, succeed, you move up and then the game's too good for you. And it, it breaks you down. You have to build yourself back up, succeed. Then you move up, but now you're an A-ball. You're always fighting, you down always again. fighting. You're always pushing yeah. until, and the definition of, of a big leaguer is someone who, you know, ha, has, has finally found, you know, hasn't found a level yet at which they fail. And then you get to the big leagues and then you really fail and you're failing in front of 40,000 people a night on national TV, showing your pathetic batting average in huge letters on the scoreboard every night so everyone knows you're failing. And that's right. that's when you know you really have to rely that's on, a, that's on a That's a tough uh, thing to overcome. Yeah. I mean, that's it, tough. 
Yeah, and right. so it was, it's They're booing, of, I guess, in many cases, oh, right? Oh, yeah, right? They're, they're booing. They know how much you're making. Right. You know, they, they right. know all the losses that you're contributing to. They, 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 they know all about your personal life. You know, right. they take your social media, which I recommend never doing anyways, but a lot of our players do, and throw it right back in your face. Right. Everyone loves, you know, your tweets when you're On getting top. big hits right. and when, when you're over. 20 and costing the team you know they're the first ones to throw it back in your face so it's just really important that guys learn to fail in the minor leagues and have something to rely upon when it happens up here because otherwise it's like a death spiral what about that first uh hire that first player you bring in when you go to one of these turnaround stories yeah it's really big um to have someone with credibility buy in and someone who's going to set a great example for everyone buying in it has to be a player um, to get the other players to rally around. There's a little separation between front office and players in terms of credibility. In Chicago, the first player we traded for was Anthony Rizzo, who's a guy I was really familiar with because we had drafted him in Boston. He's a kid who, um, his first year in the Red Sox system at age 17, was hitting 400, and then um, one month in, he got uh, uh, lymphoma and was knocked out for the season. Uh, everyone around him, you know, was was really worried and concerned. And we flew him up to Boston. We got him the best medical treatment, and and he set an unbelievable example. He goes like, "What what are you guys concerned about? Like this is it's one season, and we miss one season and come back." And he sort of went out of his way um, to, but through his work ethic, through the the, the chemo, um, reassure everybody. He's kind of looking out for everyone else while he was going through it. Came back at the end of the season. He came back. Um, instructional league against a big league pitcher and this is a 17 year old kid got one at bat at the end of the season hit a double and he was back he was in the big leagues three years later um, ended up being an all-star and the alpha of our farm system dragging people along with him and when we traded for him at the Cubs he had just had his first failure with the Padres hit like buck 90 uh, in, in his rookie season but we believed in him because we knew what was inside him and we, we knew he'd end up being an alpha again for us. And so he came and he said, okay, you guys are on a five-year plan. I'm basically in the middle of my five-year plan. Let's do this thing together. And nice. he led the way for our players. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so if you had to boil down um, for any organization, any person out there that's trying to just be better um, w with these experiences, mm -hmm. the Cubs and, and uh, Red Sox, what would boil down to three things, three uh, basic things. Three things. Um, Resilience, yeah, I guess, was yeah, one. Yeah, right? I, think, I think, you know, Buy-in is huge. Is you need a leader to to set a really bold vision. If you're, you know, why do something rote? Like you, you should be trying to do something bold and set really high standards and try to do something no one's ever done before. Set that vision and and, and get buy-in. You have to, you you can't just articulate a vision and expect people to buy in. You have to make it personal for them. So um, it's really important. You know, leadership qualities. What is that? Well, it's 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 sort of getting authentically getting people to go along with you. So. Um, anytime something goes wrong, step up and take the blame. Anytime something goes well, like push that know. credit down just, to other people and develop just learned that. We just yeah. had somebody in the, to help us with culture said, mm -hmm. you gotta have a mirror and a window, mm -hmm. right? In the mirror, every time something goes wrong, <laughs> out the window when, yeah. when things go and well. And we teach our yeah. players to do that too. So like if there's, a, if there's a bad error and it costs you the game and you're getting interviewed after the game, like even if it was the other guy's fault, yeah. you can you can build a culture like overnight by saying, you know what, I should have had that ball. I know everyone thinks it was him, but I really should have called it and made that play. That was me. And they're like, bang, you have a team. And when something goes really well, the pitcher throws a complete game or something, he's interviewed after the game, stand up and say, the catcher was unbelievable tonight with the pitches he was calling. I had four great plays made behind me. Like that's a team. And, and, but then sometimes you have management or ownership that expects out of the players, but doesn't do it themselves. So it's really important. Like if you're in the middle of a losing streak, Go on the road with the team, stand up there, answer all the questions. Like when things are going really well, fade into the background, let, let the players or other people get attention. That's really, it's, it's, it's really important to, to build an organization that way. So like, don't just talk about the values that you want, but demonstrate them. Yeah, so that, that's one. I think, you know, not being afraid to fail, not being afraid to look stupid is important. Like there's so many missed opportunities just based on decorum, based on optics, based on, you know, not wanting to be embarrassed to be an outlier. Like you, you have to, you have to embrace risk, failure. Um, it, 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 if you aren't sort of quote unquote looking bad to the rest of the industry on a regular basis, it probably means you're not innovating 
Yeah. You're not taking enough risk. You're not pushing the envelope at nothing, all. Nothing great is done if it's just the way it's always been yeah. done. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And then, and then the last thing is just, um, you know, I think the falling back on, and especially in today's day and age, like falling back on character and connectedness over, you know, like pure ability or pure skill, like you can find that, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you know, you can, you can look at a resume and know you're getting someone really smart or, you know, or you're getting someone really talented, but in, until you've like been in the trenches with someone, you probably don't know what they're all about and if, if you got to start sending me the players them. before you recruit them yeah put them out on the Spartan absolutely. course absolutely <laughs> well we should we should do that I mean spring training what a great way to <laughs> what a Find great out way to knock everyone to their knees and build them up again I can put in like a 200 foot rope climb <laughs> <laughs> that'll work maybe you're awesome <laughs> thanks man thank you that was great yeah, it's fun. that was awesome what'd you think well for me I've been a lifetime Red Sox fan right so um, you know, Theo Epstein's a bit of a, a, a larger than life character. You know, Boston's got a, a history of sports uh, superstars and heroes, if you will. Tommy and, the touchdown? Yeah, I mean, well, you can go right through, but I mean, he is right up there. He is right up there. So, uh, you know, I was there and got to hear you doing the interview and sitting there. So I, I, I enjoyed it the first time I saw it live, and I really enjoyed it this time around as well. Funny, funny thing is, I'm not a big baseball fan at all. I just happen to know Theo, and, um, but yet it was so powerful. I, I never would have thought that I would have got those lessons from a baseball GM. Well, I, he's, it's just a, such he's a, a business slow manager, move. though, right? I mean, he's a business manager. Yeah. Super smart. Um, what, Yale Law School? Yeah. Hmm. That's in, yeah, and he, he had a lot of really good insights and things like concepts I had never really heard put through, and I don't know, maybe some of you listeners out there have heard of this, but the, uh, the mirrors and windows concept, Joe, you resonate to that? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've been applying it uh, since I met him at Fenway. We've been applying it uh, to Spartan. And, and basically the idea is, you, you just heard it if you're listening out there, but the idea is uh, pass the praise on, right, out the window. Hate for it. And then take the heat. Look in the mirror and take the heat. And, and most people don't do that, right? We, we tend to pass the bad stuff on and blame it on somebody else. And then when anybody does anything good, we, we did it. It was right. And so he's saying just reverse that. And when he sees that take place in the interviews after the games and, and the player is up in front of the press and passing the praise and taking the heat, he knows he's got a team. But, but it's more than the players. It's got to be from top to bottom in the organization, right? So it's got to be. Boardroom to baseball diamond. Yeah, well, great. That's a great like phrase. That. Like yeah, that. but I mean Trade the GM, mark. but the, the, the manager, the coach, yeah. the players, everybody's got to, everybody's got to buy in. That's how you weave an ecology. That's how you actually weave a community when everyone's adhering to the same ethos and principles and patterns and you're all representing those things coherently, right? And I think, I don't know, and it, it reminds me of, I was renting a car somewhere at some airport and this guy was so nice telling me his life story and he said, you want to know what <laughs> he's like he's like he's like positivity is contagious right and pass it like, on and he's like but so is negativity and he's like yeah, as human beings walking in society we we have um we hold a lot of influence whether you're quiet or not and like the way you walk in the world and the way you interact with other people affects other people so i don't know it just it just kind of like you you have to be really mindful of what you're putting out there. You know what he said? He said, um, baseball, like life, we understand like 3 to 4% of it. Yeah. And I would add, like Sephra, we understand 3 <laughs> to 4% of our. <laughs> an enigma. <laughs> like, yeah. you got, like an onion. Keep unraveling. unraveling. But he did talk about testing. You know, like when you were uh, bringing in a new player and talking about the fit. I, I was fascinated when he talked about doing the simulations. And, and you would think, okay, they run it through. What did he say? He, he, 10 years out or whatever. How many thousands of games in a simulation to figure out who is going to go, how they mesh. Yeah, you know, I, statistically. I, I was in finance. I was on Wall Street at the time when that became very popular for trading, where they would do back testing and forward testing and see uh, what would happen in this environment or that environment. So, uh, But I never thought they were applying that to baseball. Well, I can They're, apply it to ecology. Um, <laughs> we, we are sure you can. Yeah. I mean, I, I said it before, but it's the same thing when you're rebuilding a team, right? A lot of these people are out there restoring the native environments that get destroyed and depleted. And you have to have, like, you're putting in the new players of, into that environment, which are the old endemic native species. And it takes a while for those ground covers and those trees to all reroot and work together, that mycelium that I always talked about, to weave them all together. 
But after that team grows up and goes into a little bit succession, you see five years out, you win the World Series. You see these the, different things. There's, the difference, there's strength though, and patience and, and rebuilding that soil to be strong. The difference, and I think Colonel Nile hone in on this one, is you've got millions of years for that to take place. And right, you've got a very short window in the sporting world. And he even talked about it, that during the first year, they didn't reach the heights they thought they would. And so the fans were, hey, same old Boston, same old Red Sox, whatever. So that does, though, bring the team together, right? And the team learned, realized that they had to focus on themselves, and they, it was an internal change, yeah. an internal motivation, and that they had to do it. Uh, think about a couple years, I guess it would be two years ago now, when the uh, Eagles beat uh, uh, the Patriots in a World Series. They dubbed no one ever beats the greatest of all time. They dubbed themselves as underdogs, the entire season Just had power and outage. nobody could no, you know, nobody believes in us. Nobody can trust us or nobody, nobody believes in us. Nobody uh, wants us to win kind of thing. And so they, they, they bond together. It's sure. us against them. Sure. All right. Three takeaways, right? What did he say? He said, set a bold vision and get by in, right? Yep. Which you talked about. Don't be afraid to look stupid. Tough for I do that every day. <laughs> <laughs> and what does he mean by that, though? Is that just in making changes, like try things? No, I think if, I think I think that, but I think also if if the entire town is against you, and 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 this young manager comes in right, and he's trying new things, um, doesn't matter if he believes in in his vision and his strategy. You got to go with it, okay. right? You can't you Walk can't your vision. You can't play according to what people want to see uh, out there because that that doesn't win. Um, and then character and connectedness. I like how right. he taps Colonel Nye, not me, on character. Well, no, because I mean, but but you have to. You've got to you've got to have a team. The team as you you've already much more clearly articulated. It. It's got a mesh, right? You've got to, it's a collection of characters, yep. collection of huge egos, and they have to. Each person has to fit in with no kind of rough edges, right? They all have to connect they, together. Yeah, coalesce. It's true. Here's a question for you. We have applied this window and mirror methodology that we learned from Theo to Spartan over the last few months, and it is powerful. Apply it to your life. Apply it to your organization. Apply it to your family. Let us know. Is it just as powerful as we think it is? Yeah, we'd love to hear. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Misfit Vapor 2, the perfect smartwatch for Spartans. Right now, all Spartan Up podcast listeners can take $50 off Misfit Vapor 2 with the code SPARTAN50. Head over to misfit.com to redeem. This offer expires June 26, 2019. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Spartan Up podcast. Let us know, have you tried the windows and mirrors thing? Have you let someone else on your team take credit when things go well? Or taken the heat when things go wrong? Has it helped you be a better leader, be a better team member? Find us on Instagram at Spartan Up Podcast. Let us know what worked, what didn't, what you tried. And remember, we're here for you almost every day of the week with interviews every Tuesday and with a team of experts to help you stay on track and be your partners in resilience training for mind and body. See you next time.